Hey, Salt Lake, it's Allie, and I want you to know that we are hiring. CityCast Salt Lake is looking for a senior account executive to join our team. The benefits and compensation are great. We have probably too much fun, and we are pretty good at crushing our goals. If you care about this podcast and our newsletter, have some sales experience, and know a lot of people in the Salt Lake Valley, you should apply. Get all the details at citycast.fm slash jobs. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. Data from the point in time homelessness count is in. Major League Baseball players are lukewarm on us, and we dig deep to say something nice about our rival city. Lead producer Emily Means joins me to make sense of the week's top stories. And later, producer Ivana Martinez joins us for Pick of the Week. It's Friday, July 7th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Good morning, Emily Means. Good morning, Ali Vallarta. We have some homelessness data at last. It comes around once a at year. Last. And that time is now. Results of the point in time count are in for the whole state, not just Salt Lake County. I think before we get into this, we should explain what the point in time count is. Do you want me to do it? I want you to do it. And that's because you have participated in the point in time (laughs) count for uh, years now. Yes. I am obsessed with this very intense form of volunteerism. And I have in the past convinced a lot of listeners to join me. So... Basically, in simplest terms, what the point in time count is, it is a annual census of all of the unsheltered folks across the nation that is handled by individual counties. And it's called the point in time count because it happens during basically the exact same point in time. It's uh, taken over three consecutive nights in January. The reason every county in the country has to do it is because they report that data up, up, up to the federal government, and it determines what kinds of resources counties get for homelessness. Money goes to the county, then the county distributes it to the cities within the county. So that's, that is in essence what the point in time count is. It is 100% volunteer-led, so it is like caseworkers, people who work in homelessness, who are already so strapped in this um, line of work, who get up three nights in a row and hit the streets from 4 to 6 a.m. to participate in the count, and then a massive volunteer effort. And I just want to say, before we get into like the, the actual results of the count, they said that this year they saw double the number of volunteers that they had last year, which is extraordinary. And I think indicates that this is an issue that's really on Salt Lakers' minds. It's really important to them. And people really care and they want to be a part of solutions and they want to be a part of like information gathering to solve this problem, this crisis. Yeah. And Allie, honestly, you convinced me to volunteer for this effort. Um, I, I did it just just one night and I had never participated ever before. So I want to thank you for uh, <laughs> extending this opportunity to me. And it was incredibly eye-opening because you go and you talk with individuals and, um, you know, you find out how long they've been homeless, where they spent, you know, the past couple nights, were they Mm -hmm. in a shelter, you know, a lot of personal details that uh, they share with you if if they feel comfortable doing so. And so that was really eye-opening, connecting with people who were literally in an emergency shelter at the time. Um, and like you said, you know, this this turnout we had in Salt Lake County was huge this year. And Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness says that leads to more accurate data collection. Mm-hmm. And so um, what they found is that we saw a nearly 10 percent increase in people experiencing homelessness in Salt Lake County over the past year. Mm-hmm. And Allie, I think for me, every single year when we receive this data, we see an increase. Yeah. Right? 
And that's hard for me to reckon with because we don't see a double digit increase in our population every single year. No. As a whole. When we talk about that increase in homelessness as well, it's not just an increase in the percentage of people that are becoming homeless for the first time. Yeah. It's also an increase in people who are what's defined as chronically homeless, right? Which means that like they're experiencing homelessness year after year. So yeah, I mean, there are a lot of factors that we could attribute that to. It's not our job to analyze this data and attribute it to a variety of factors. But I also think it's worth noting that you mentioned the 10% increase just in Salt Lake County. The increase in Utah, like statewide, the number of Utahns experiencing homelessness on this you know, particular day in January, since 2019 has risen more than 30%, which is a lot. Yeah. And we also saw like a rise in numbers outside of Salt Lake. And I think a lot of the reason for that is that we're seeing a lot of the new shelters are being opened outside of Salt Lake. And when people enter into the shelter, they become a part of the count. So, yeah, I mean, this data is a smack in the face, but I also think it's not terribly surprising. No, like you said, we're not going to analyze every single contributing factor, but a big one is the cost of housing. Yeah. And, you know, we've been dealing with this affordable housing crisis for, what, like at least a decade here in the state. But it's just the case that it's too expensive. Rent has increased over the past two years more than in the past decade. That's according to the Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) I mean... This is a statewide issue and, uh, you know, just kind of like looking at the way the legislature prioritizes this issue in the budget. This past year, we saw $50 million going towards affordable housing. The year before that, $55 million. But that's just a fraction of what Governor Spencer Cox asked for in his in his budget proposal. And Ali, yeah. just kind of like, Looking at this data and seeing how this is clearly tied to uh, increasing housing costs, I was brought back to a time when I was covering the legislature and we asked legislative leadership about, you know, the money they were allocating towards affordable housing and how small it was in comparison to the request from the Mm -hmm. governor. And what we heard was, well, we need to see if they use this money effectively first, or like if if it's actually put to good use. <laughs> and that was jaw-dropping. Jaw-dropping to hear from a legislature that is so focused on real estate development as well, yeah. <laughs> like that maybe affordable housing isn't necessarily worth investing in to, to the level that other people in the state think it is. So, you know, hopefully this data show that it is worth investing in at the highest level and fully and including rental assistance, which is specifically what state homelessness coordinator Wayne Niederhauser pointed to. Like, we need money for rental assistance if we're going to prevent people from becoming homeless. I mean, if they were really interested in having a conversation about ways that they could legislate aside from appropriating funds for affordable housing or to solve our affordable housing crisis. Let's start with allowing cities to implement rent control. That feels like a good place to start, right? On the note of investing, actually, in this crisis, the Utah Homelessness Council did approve $3 million for a new emergency shelter for families. That's pretty big. Just last week. And that is pretty big. Where is this thing going to be? That is a great question, (laughs) Allie. And we're not entirely sure yet. We've heard, you know, thrown around maybe Sandy City. Yeah. Maybe in South Salt Lake. So the current family shelter is in Midvale. It was full Mm -hmm. when I visited it years ago. And this past winter, we saw that there was not enough room for families experiencing homelessness. And, you know, I'm shocked that we even have to think about that like Mm -hmm. why why do families with children have to struggle to find some place to 
have safe shelter. Not entirely sure yet where the new family shelter will go. Um, The State Homelessness Council is also looking at providing a new space for the medically vulnerable population. So older folks who have chronic illness, um, that's been in the works for a long time, too. So, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, surely wherever it goes, there will be a lot of pushback from those communities, as we've seen with with the attempts to locate shelters in the past. And also worth noting, I mean, like when we think about homelessness, I think it's important that we are constantly emphasizing in this conversation that a lot of people experiencing homelessness in this state are families or are children, like too mm-hmm. many, right? In 2022, the number of people experiencing homelessness who were from families increased by 30%. Like that is tremendous. So that's why family shelters in particular are so important. And I think that's also why a lot of homelessness advocates have been trying to sort of like drill home that particular point when they are negotiating, quote unquote, with the legislature for some for like crisis funding and a, and a critical response is because, of course, Utah loves to claim that it is a family's first state. And if right. that is the case, then let's see an investment in families that are currently unsheltered. Right. Well, Ali, one thing I want to leave us with uh, is an action item, because I think that oh. this crisis is uh I mean, you could look at this and you could say, wow, it's pretty hopeless. I can't do anything about this. But looking ahead to the rest of the week, it's going to be really hot. Uh, We're going to hit 100 degrees this next week. So this is Mm. a great time to check in on your neighbors. Um, You can also donate supplies to grassroots organizations like Unsheltered Utah to the Coconut Hut. They are looking for hot weather items. Water. Reusable water bottles, sunscreen, things that help people keep cool and stay safe in the sun. And also, Salt Lake County's cool zones are now open until October. So people can cool off at libraries, at rec centers, um, get into the the air-conditioned facilities and out of the sun and, you know, have a chance to rehydrate. So Mm -hmm. make sure to check in on your neighbors while, while things are hot this week. Okay, Emily, you and I are always, I feel like we're both big advocates for Salt Lake City gobbling up more sports teams. <laughs> <laughs> I want us to be on the map, damn it. <laughs> I want to be able to watch live sports in Salt Lake City all the time, okay? So two months ago, of course, we have to mention that this was in the wake of the Millers packing up the Salt Lake Bees minor league team for daybreak. We saw Larry H. Miller Corporation holding yet another press conference, this time on the west side of the city, saying, come hell or high water, Salt Lake City is getting a major league baseball team. So led by local billionaire Gail Miller, former owner of the Utah Jazz, this coalition that's calling themselves Big League Utah announced that they are bidding for an MLB team. And they've already got the like plot of land ready to go to build a stadium. It is the near the like former site of Rocky Mountain Power on the west side. So the MLB commissioner, Rob Manfred, said that he's interested in expanding the league to include two more teams. And basically, it's we're all just giving pick me energy. It's <laughs> us. Nashville, Montreal, Charlotte, Austin, Portland, Vancouver, Orlando, Raleigh, Durham, and oh, San wow. Juan, Puerto Rico, which I I love Salt Lake City. I want us to have everything good. But part of me is like, please pick San Juan, Puerto Rico. <laughs> From that list, I don't think I would pick Salt Lake City. <laughs> well, okay, so this is the thing. So this outlet called The Athletic pulled 100 active players across 22 different teams. Which of these cities would you like to play in? Like, if it were up to you to decide where we go, where should we go? Salt Lake City pulled dead last. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Well, there was, okay, so in the Salt Lake Tribune story about this, 
Uh, there was a quote from Keith Johnson, who's currently the Salt Lake Bees minor league team manager. And I swear to God, I died when I read this quote. Okay. Salt Lake is kind of a sleeper city. A lot of people are like, ah, Salt Lake. <laughs> I can't argue with that. <laughs> End scene. <laughs> well, Ali, this is honestly kind of like riling me up. Uh, and it makes me want to fight. It makes me want to fight other cities. Should we get in a fight with another city? Yeah. Okay. So did you see this like thing circulating that was like, say something nice about your nemesis city? Let's identify who our nemesis city is. It's Denver. It is. I'll just come out and say it. I don't like Denver because to me, it's just big Salt Lake City. And I think what we have going for us is that, you know, we're we're a small lake city. And so when you expand, it, we lose the, you lose the charm. Right. Except I have to point out something that you're doing here, which is that I asked you why Denver is our nemesis city. And you just told me why we're better than Denver. <laughs> but if we were so confident that we are better than Denver, they wouldn't be our nemesis city. Yeah, right? You're right. Like in order for a rivalry to exist, there has to be a tension. There has to be an ongoing competition to be the best, right? So if we're so sure that we're better than Denver, then why do we care? And the reason we care is because we're not. We are a <laughs> deeply insecure city. And, and I hate that about us. I think it's our worst trait is that we're always like, we have this inferiority complex. We're constantly comparing ourselves to other cities. Like we're the Portland of the blah. We're, the, we're like Denver, but more charming. And it's like, no, we're just us, okay? We're just. Ugh. But here's the thing. I'll tell you why I hate Denver and tell why me. I think Denver is our nemesis city. Denver people are constantly evangelizing their city in a way that makes me want to scream and throw a book at them. Like, because I just don't like evangelists in general, which of course is why I moved to Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but like, there is something about, like, especially growing up on the East Coast, like, everyone I know, like, from high school who, like, had a rough time when we were in high school was like, I'm moving to Denver and then my life's going to get better. And then every year that I go home and see them, they're like, everything's amazing in Denver. Everything's amazing. Everything's so great. Our beer is the best and our beards are the longest and <laughs> our mountains and peaks and perfect. And have you been incredible. to the Red Rocks Amphitheater? Have you even <laughs> been to the Red Rocks Amphitheater? I did and the yoga Nuggets there. won the championship this That's year. Okay, right. fine, we get it. Yeah, and the <laughs> Avalanche are good suddenly, and and it's like. Can you just pump the freaking brakes? And so that's why I hate Denver. But what was, what were we, well, what we were, were going to say something, we're nice, say about something nice about Denver. The other thing is that they surely don't consider us their nemesis, right? No, like, they don't think about us ever. I know. And that's why it hurts so much. And that's why we hate you so bad. Yes. But I will say one nice thing about Denver is, uh, I mean, they have way more modern illicit substance laws. <laughs> okay, I really thought you were going to go the public transit route, but okay. They have great beer. Um, uh -huh. I think they have a very nice walkable downtown. Mm -hmm. And that's all I can say about Denver. Oh, I also like Blucifer, the giant uh, blue demon horse that you pass on the way to their airport. Mm, okay. I think that's a nice touch. Um, oh, you know what I have to say about Denver? They did a very smart thing in 1976. And I still give them kudos for that. And that is that they said no to the Olympics. <laughs> that's what I have to say that's nice about Denver. And to put a bow on this, I do need to tell you, Emily Means, actually I'm flying to Denver tonight. Oh my and God. And thank God I land before this episode publishes because I'm pretty sure they would not let me off the plane. <laughs> well, let's be clear. We have colleagues in Denver, CityCast Denver, uh, an incredible team of podcasters and newsletter editors over there. Too true. Um, and we welcome you to say anything at all about Salt Lake. That's really all we want is yeah. for you to think about us. Can you just freaking see us? Us? Can you just see us? We just want to be seen. Okay. <sighs> Pick me. Pick me. All right. Speaking of picks, before we get out of here, producer Ivana Martinez is joining us for Pick of the Week. Welcome, Ivana. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi, Ivana. Hello. Ivana, what is your pick of the week? 
Um, my pick of the week is East Canyon Reservoir. Mm. I went paddleboarding for the first time. I'm not a big outdoorsy gal, mm-hmm. but it was actually my first time this summer, and I think it's my new obsession, and I think everybody should go do that. It's su- stunningly gorgeous out there right now, and the water levels are so high, and just there's nothing like it. How do you get a paddleboard if you don't have one or you live in an apartment without space? Like, Where do you ha- put your paddleboard? How do I access this recreation? I mean, you can rent a paddleboard, but also it's like I think they they store quite nicely, like in a backpack. So they're not too like uh, massively huge. You can put it in your car, I think, like I do most things. I live in quite a small apartment, so that's an option. Ivana Martinez, the outdoor gal. Yeah, <laughs> this is news to me, but um, we yes, are okay. venturing to new places this year, guys. Yeah. I went paddleboarding on the Jordanelle one morning last summer with my friend Stephanie, who lives up in Park City. Mm-hmm. And we did like just a little bit of the Jordanelle, which is the Jordanelle is pretty big. And but I was like so scared I didn't stand up the whole time. I just like <laughs> stayed on my knees on the paddleboard. But I'm also kind of like an adventure quencher. Like I'm like I I like doing stuff and trying new things, and I'm mm-hmm. always like zero to sixty. Let's just do the most intense version first. So we're paddleboarding, paddleboarding, paddleboarding. It's like seven a.m., and she was like, "You know, one day I want to paddleboard the entire parameter of the oh Jordan. Like that's on my like kind of bucket list for Utah." And I was like, "Let's do it! Like I'm in." And she goes, "Well, why don't we get you to stand up first? <laughs> <laughs> Baby steps. You know, I haven't st- stood up yet. Um, so that is also on my goal. I'm like, I'm quite a clumsy person. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't really go great with the great outdoors. But you know what? We're, we're out here trying. And, you know, maybe this is our year, Allie. We'll stand up on a paddleboard together. Maybe we'll go, until, we'll like, out. A, until the faintest zephyr hits and knocks us both into the freezing <laughs> cold water. But sounds delightful. It what a great is. time. Quick PSA, please wear your life jacket. Wear your life jacket. I, back in my reporting days, I received so many press releases that were like, please wear your life jackets when you're at the reservoir, y'all. So Mm. just putting that out there. Thank you very much. And a lot of state parks will um, actually have them just to like, they'll let people use them. I got scolded this last weekend for not wearing one and I didn't know. So yeah, wear your life jacket. Okay. All right. Thank Emily you. Means, what is your pick of the week? All right. I have an indoor gal pick of the week. No surprise there. Let's but hear it. Uh, there is a new coffee shop in my neighborhood. Uh, it's called Midway Coffee, and it Ooh. is inside the Salt and Olive uh, Italian restaurant on 30s next to Gormandy's. Okay. Uh, and it's super cool. I went to their grand opening last weekend, got myself a little latte. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Allie, um, I went to a grand opening. Did you, I literally, my eyes <laughs> it just was flew open and I shook my head. What? Listen, it was an accident. I didn't know it was a grand opening i just happened upon it and Mm -hmm. uh nice little spot for a for a coffee shop what's your drink of choice emily uh oat milk latte with honey yeah hot or iced wow always that's very shishi of you Mm -hmm. (laughs) i am who i am what's your pick (laughs) Allie? okay my pick of the week is also an indoor activity and um you'll be shocked to hear that it does not involve a bar So my pick of the week is dance battles at the Herc. Yes. So the Herc is the hip hop education and resource center. It is on State Street just south of I-80. It is one of, I think, the coolest institutions in Salt Lake City. And they do dance classes for all ages. Like you – if. I think the youngest students are like six years old up until like well into adulthood. Like anyone can take dance classes there and they offer a whole like spectrum. It's not just hip hop. It's like everything. But they will occasionally host these dance battles and they are usually freestyle. Usually there's like two categories. There's freestyle and then there's break dancing. And they have a DJ and they have an MC and they like sometimes do them inside and they sometimes do them outside in the parking lot. And I went to one last week and 
What a freaking fun time. And here's what's so great about it. A, this is an all ages situation. So like if you are looking for something to do with your kids on a Friday evening, that's like also really fun and entertaining for you. And like not totally like, how do I say that? Not totally like cheesy kid stuff. You know what I mean? Like you can take them down to this incredibly cool dance battle. And yeah, these dancers are amazing. They Duke it out on the floor. The DJ is always fabulous. It is like a not drinking kind of party situation, but it still feels like you're in a club. Yeah. Um, it's just like a privilege to witness. And I think everyone should experience a Herc dance battle. So um, you can follow them on Instagram and they post whenever they've got one coming up. But it's such a special, it's just a special place in Salt Lake City. And I've recently become aware of it. And now I want to be there all the time. That's very cool. I didn't know anything about that. Um, and now I think we need to do a CityCast Salt Lake team dance class, break dance class. Is that it? <laughs> can you imagine? Um, just we can discuss a team building line. activity. <laughs> <laughs> it would definitely be an activity. Uh, <laughs> and also like at the Herc People are studying these styles of dance that are like historically black, historically mm -hmm. queer, like voguing, whacking, like break dance. And I think as part of the education comes the cultural education. Like it's a very holistic approach to like and thoughtful approach to teaching this form of dance outside of like just the maneuvers and like in the dance battles, like they talk about respect and like respecting the genre and like there's – it's just – it's like this entire art form. And like I said, it's just a total privilege to witness. So – A great pick. That's right. Speaking of which, let's start this weekend. It has been an absolute joy to uh, end my week with both of you. And I will see you on Monday when I get back from Denver if they don't eat me alive <laughs> for all of the slander that I – If you don't decide to move there. <laughs> See you Monday, Allie. How dare See you? you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Our lead producer is Emily Means. Our producers are Ivana Martinez and Lizzie Goldsmith. Our newsletter editor is Terina Ria, and our host is me, Ali Vallarta. Music is by the local band Mitochondria. We will be back Monday morning with more from around this city. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.